So I'm going to be talking about phylogeny estimation. And you see there are a lot of birds on my picture is because I've been working on birds uh, in keeping with other speakers. So everyone knows what a phylogeny is. I'm going to be talking about species phylogenies and how do we estimate them. And I'm going to be talking specifically about doing this in a genome scale context. There's multiple reasons you need to look at genome scale data, but one of them is that individual parts of the genome actually have different histories. And therefore, if you look at only a single gene or even just a small number of, of genes, you may get very strange uh, responses. So the reason for this gene tree discordance, there are multiple reasons. The, the dominant one, potentially, is something called incomplete lineage sorting, and actually Molly already talked about that. But it's something that happens when you have either very large population sizes or you have very uh, short times between speciation events. So incomplete lineage sorting is one of the things that causes gene trees to be different from each other and different from the species tree, and that's the problem I'll be talking about today. So this is a mathematical model called the multi-species coalescent. And it, there's a forward model and a backwards model, but they're equivalent. The main thing to understand from this is that the multi-species coalescent, the dots here represent individuals, and so you have population sizes and times between events. Um, it increases the probability of having trees, gene trees, that are different from the species tree. Now, when I say a gene tree, I'm talking about the tree on a specific region of the genome. It doesn't have to be a gene. It could be intronic data. It doesn't have to be a gene. But gene trees can be different from the species tree, and the gene trees evolve within the species tree. This particular picture is showing a gene tree that is different from the species tree in that uh, you do not see, you see uh, gorilla and orangutan as siblings in the gene tree and they shouldn't be. So incomplete lineage sorting, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's the outcome of the multi-species coalescent process that can produce gene trees that are different from the species tree, and it's known to confound many different gr biological groups. And the interesting thing here is that there's a big debate in the literature about how to analyze your data when you have this gene tree heterogeneity. The, the debate is centered um, on the one hand about the theoretical guarantees, and on the other hand, empirical performance. So that's the thing that I'm going to be talking about. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this model, the multi-species coalescent model, and then what it means to have a statistically consistent method for estimating species trees under this model, and a new method called ASTRAL that we've developed to be able to do this on very large data sets, and then some open questions. Okay, so again, we want to look at estimating species trees from multiple genes. And the two major competing approaches, one ignores the heterogeneity and simply takes the sequence alignments from the different loci and concatenates them together and then analyzes this large concatenated alignment however you want to. So you could do maximum likelihood, you could do maximum parsimony, you could do a Bayesian method, whatever you like. So that's called concatenation. The other basic approach is to estimate trees on each of the different loci. Again, these loci do not need to be genes, but you estimate trees on the different loci, and then you combine the gene trees together. Um, there are other approaches as well. These are the two dominant ones because of speed. So what does statistical consistency mean? In the context of you know, a usual just estimator, you want the error in the estimation to go to zero as the amount of data goes to infinity. The error does not need to go in a, to zero monotonically. It just needs to go to zero. Uh, in the context of species tree estimation, what you're looking for is the genomic data going to infinity. So the number of loci that you're sampling should go to infinity, right? Not like we have infinite data. Okay, but that's the meaning of statistical consistency is that your estimate error should go to zero. So what methods are statistically consistent? None of the ones you're familiar with. Um, so concatenation performed in the usual unpartitioned way, not consistent. Looking for the most frequent gene tree, not consistent. Um, standard super tree methods and, and uh, you know, you take all these gene trees and you find a super tree, or you take all the gene trees and you find a consensus tree, not consistent. So worse, not only are they not guaranteed to converge to the correct tree, they could even provably converge to the wrong tree. Now, that's bad news, right? So on the basis of theory, you would say, okay, we can't have business as usual. 
Um, but the interesting thing is that this mathematical model produces and defines a probability distribution on the gene trees and on the gene tree topologies in particular. And therefore, you can use that probability distribution to estimate the species tree. So here's what we can do. We can't just take the most frequently observed gene tree. That would be the most probable gene tree. That doesn't work. So you can look at your data and say, oh, well, this gene tree appears 50% of the time, and the other gene trees are each a small number of times. So let's just use that. Um, it turns out that the most probable gene tree may not be the true species tree. There are exceptions. Uh, the exceptions are rooted three species trees and unrooted four species trees. So this thing where the most probable gene tree is not the species tree is called the anomaly zone. And uh, you can ask the person in the back row, Noah Rosenberg, all about this, because he's the one who basically came up with almost all the theory here. Okay, but we can get rooted three-leaf species trees, and we can get unrooted four-leaf species trees. Therefore, we can do algorithms by doing a kind of divide and conquer. So, summary methods take gene trees and try to estimate the species tree. Imagine you take all those gene trees, and these are rooted gene trees, so we could take the gene trees and look at the three-leaf species gene trees and look at the most frequent three-leaf gene trees and try to combine them. If they were unrooted trees, we could look at the unrooted four-leaf species gene trees and try to combine the most probable ones. So coalescent based methods that are statistically consistent will converge to the correct species tree as the amount of data goes to infinity. MPS is one that works with rooted gene trees. Bucky, the population tree in Bucky works with unrooted uh, gene trees and many others as well. All of them guaranteed to be statistically consistent. Coestimation methods are even better. They will take gene sequence alignments and coestimate gene trees and species trees simultaneously. They have nice statistical guarantees, and they give very good results. Um, so we'd like to use coestimation methods, but they're too slow. So what we're going to be focusing on is can we use these summary methods to get species trees? The main competition is concatenation. Again, these are the only ones that are reasonably fast. So the traditional approach of concatenation, which is what you will see every time you open you know, science or nature or MBE or anything and see a species tree, it's estimated using concatenation. There's very few cases where it's estimated using anything else. So it's unfortunately unpartitioned maximum likelihood is provably statistically inconsistent for some model species trees, okay? Now, that's a, uh, a theoretical theorem. It's not a simulation. A simulation can also show bad results, but this is a proof, okay? So the problem is that on simulated data, you see mixed performance. It's not universally the case that concatenation is bad. Concatenation is often more accurate than the leading coalescent methods. And here's an example of such a simulation study that we performed. Now, these are data that were developed by Cecile Anne from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, these are 11 taxon data sets with varying number of genes and a uh, relatively low amount of ILS, incomplete lineage sorting. Um, and what I'm showing is tree error on the y-axis. So you want the, the proportion of the edges that you fail to recover. So um, on the y-axis, tree error, so lower is better. On the x-axis is the number of genes. And what I'm showing in red is star beast. That's the co-estimation of gene trees and species trees. In yellow is concatenation using maximum likelihood. And then everything else is some kind of a coalescent method or, or just some kind of a consensus method. So with only five genes, the most accurate method is concatenation. The second most accurate method is star beast, and everything else has relatively high error. With 10 genes, concatenation and star beast are equal, and then with more genes, concatenation and star beast have recovered the true tree, but, but some other methods are also doing well. So what do we see? The two best methods are concatenation and star beast. Concatenation does well under relatively low amounts of gene tree heterogeneity. 
Starbeast does well also. Why is Starbeast better? Because it's actually co-estimating the gene trees, it gets better gene trees. When you combine those gene trees that it computes using other methods like MPS, you get the same quality species tree. So what we're seeing is that the two best methods, concatenation and Starbeast. If you have a higher amount of ILS, a higher amount of incomplete lineage sorting, concatenation can be less accurate. But for lower amounts, it's very good. So one of the real questions for biologists is how much incomplete lineage sorting is actually going on in your data? Because that is actually the thing you need to know to figure out what methods to run. OK, but Starbeast, the reason it's good is it gets better gene trees. So gene tree estimation error is the leading problem, as far as I can tell, in coalescent analysis that operates by trying to combine gene trees. When you have poor gene trees, you're going to get a poor species tree. Poor gene trees are a matter of course. It's what happens with any kind of genome scale analysis. Unless you throw out a lot of your data, you're going to have a lot of data in which there's not that much phylogenetic signal. If you take all those and you analyze them and you get gene trees, you're going to have poor gene trees, you're going to get poor species trees. This is just what happens with big data sets. So this is the key issue in the debate. Now, two projects that I was involved in, one is the avian phylogenomics projects. As I said, I work on birds. Um, we had 14,000 different loci and a huge amount of gene tree heterogeneity. Every single gene tree we got was different from the concatenation tree that we got. So imagine that, 14,000 different gene trees, all different from our species tree. On the other hand, we had also a rapid radiation, as far as we could tell, that would produce this incom incom um, incomplete lineage sorting. And we had two different trees. The concatenation analysis was one tree. The coalescent analysis was another. And they were very different from each other. And so we had this problem. How do we analyze our data if we're getting two very different trees? So our solution was statistical binning. And this was published also in that major uh, science issue with eight papers on birds. A statistical binning is a way of getting better gene trees. And if you can get better gene trees, you can get a better species tree. And we used statistical binning to get better gene trees. And then we got an MPS analysis of those newly estimated gene trees and got a new coalescent-based species tree. And this is a comparison between the two trees. On the left is the one we got with binning. On the right is the one we got without binning. And everything in red is something that contradicts prior studies. So with binning, we got something that looked like our concatenation analysis. Without binning, we got something that contradicted it, which tells us something about the impact of gene tree estimation. OK, the plant project was a different analysis. It actually was done. Um, after the bird analysis, published before but done after. Uh, again, massive gene tree heterogeneity. Here we wanted to use MPS, but we could not because we had too many taxa. MPS doesn't really run on large data sets. But the more important thing is that we had a lot of genes which were lacking outgroups. And therefore, we couldn't root our gene trees. And therefore, we couldn't use MPS because it requires rooted gene trees. Solution, we developed a new method called Astral. Astral works with unrooted gene trees. It's polynomial time and it's statistically consistent. So uh, it's available open source software, et cetera, et cetera. The, main, the algorithm is based upon finding an optimal solution, that is a globally optimal solution, to the species tree that maximizes the quartet support subject to a constraint set. So it computes a constraint set of biopartitions and finds the best tree within that constraint set. OK, it's being used on many different data sets, not just the ones we're working on, but many across the country and actually around the world. Um, we did a simulation study to evaluate performance. And I'm going to show you what we saw. This is what we see uh, on the x-axis is the number of species. On the y-axis, again, is the tree error. And we're comparing MPS to astral. And when you have only 10 species, they have the same error. As you increase the number of species, the error goes up for MPS a lot. It goes up only a small amount for astral. Now, at that point, MPS can no longer finish its analyses within 24 hours, but Astral can continue to run. And so this is 1,000 species with 1,000 genes, and it can complete within 24 hours on a sequential um, machine. So very good trees on very large data sets. The other method that we compared it to is NJST, which is neighbor joining on an average 
uh, a matrix of average internode distances. Surprise, surprise, it works really well. I don't understand it. Um, it's almost as accurate as Astral on these data. In some other data sets, it's actually even more accurate. So where it's going to be better, where it's going to be worse, we're not exactly sure. Um, the advantage right now that Astral has over NJS is largely running time. It's much faster. Okay, so on biological data, this is another interesting story. There had been a study showing um, uh, the placement of Amborella depended upon whether or not you did a concatenation analysis or a coalescent analysis. And the argument was made by the authors of the coalescent analysis that since there's a rapid radiation and theirs is a coalescent analysis, they should have the correct tree and the concatenation tree should be wrong. We reanalyzed the data using astral. It's also a coalescent analysis. And this time, we got a tree that matches the concatenation analysis. So what this is telling you is it's not just a question of whether or not you're doing a coalescent analysis. It's a question of which coalescent analysis you're doing. OK, so future directions. So this is research that we're doing that I think is of interest perhaps to others. So first of all, just better ways of combining gene trees. So combining gene trees that are more robust to gene tree estimation error. Secondly, better ways of estimating gene trees in the context of a multi-locus analysis. So when you have multiple genes and they're all evolving down the same species tree, you can use the fact that they're all evolving down the same tree to get better gene trees. That's exactly what Star Beast does. So that's another research area. How can you do that improvement of gene tree estimations by taking advantage of the fact you have many different genes evolving within the same tree? A third one is a theoretical question. Better theory about the robustness of gene tree estimation error. Is there robustness or is there not? Right now, all the theory is in the statement of if you have uh, an increasing number of true gene trees, will you recover the species tree? What if you have gene tree estimation error? We do not know of any methods that are robust to this. And finally, better single site methods. That's methods that operate not by estimating gene trees, but just looking at the patterns of the sites. That's another very interesting direction. And some of the uh, methods in this area are now being used to great advantage. So this theoretical question, here's an open question. What is the impact of gene tree estimation error on species tree estimation? So Sebastian Rock and I addressed this asking, if you bound the number of sites per locus and let the number of loci increase, do you have any methods that are statistically consistent? The answer seems to be, if you have a strict molecular clock, which is to say that evolution is exactly proportional to time, OK, strict molecular clock. Then lots of methods are statistically consistent, even with a single site per locus. On the other hand, if you do not have a strict molecular clock, we have no positive results. So you're using methods to estimate species trees. You think they're statistically consistent, but the conditions under which they're statistically consistent are unrealistic. And therefore, it really comes down to empirical performance and really no theorems, unless we can develop better theorems. OK, with that, the acknowledgments. There's a lot of papers on this topic. You can get them off my website. But I want to thank very much the people who worked on this. So my student, Siavash Mirarab, uh, on the left, he's now a professor at UCSD. Uh, Bizet, who's second from the left, he's still working on this stuff. Uh, Bastien Bousseau, who's in France, has done some wonderful work also on gene duplication and loss and how you deal with species tree estimation there. And of course, Sebastian Rock. Thank you. Do you have questions for Dr. Warna? Give it to Noah. I was just going to ask about the, the controversies about the different bird phylogenies and, you know, I guess some views being that the, the different estimates coming from different groups are, are substantially different and some maybe being that they're not, not so different and maybe just what your view is. So you want to know what do I think about the bird phylogeny? Um, well, I personally think that since there is for sure uh, rapid radiation, I don't think that's a question. There's going to be incomplete linear sorting, but there's also going to be other sources of discord that we have yet to be able to figure out how much they're impacting the phylogeny. Hybridization could be happening. Um, but this is a time, well, well, two things. First of all, as we get better gene tree, species tree estimations, 
I'm sure some things are going to change. Absolutely some things are going to change. What, whether or not these are the ones that people are fighting over, I don't know. Um, but this is a time of rapid method development. And so I think we should look again in like two or three years and see. But one of the things that people have been asking is maybe you should be doing denser taxon sampling. So with denser taxon sampling, you're going to break up the long branches and maybe things will change there. On the other hand, with denser taxon sampling, you're going to get even shorter branches and so you're going to have even more gene tree heterogeneity. So I don't know that taxon sampling is going to address this issue. But method development could address the issue, and, and that's where I'm looking. Any other questions? Okay, thank you thank very much. You.